So we're going to discuss uh, Terry Eagleton's uh, account of the rise of English. It's the first chapter in his book on literary theory and introduction. This is the second edition. I don't know if there's a third edition out yet. I don't think so. I think there's, it's only a second. But I will draw to your attention, first of all, I said to the class before I turned this on that I think it's a pretty good account. It's compelling. It's uh, well written. And uh, I think he is persuasive in his account. But of course, uh, in, uh, in all uh, situations where there's uh, controversy, if you only hear one side, that side is per tends to be persuasive until you hear the other side. And I'm not going to dispute much of ha what he says here. I would object to the framing of it. So just to speak to that, he begins the rise of English with, when does English begin? What time do people start age? When do people start speaking English, roughly? Freeze when they're here, he would tell you you, know, you should know exactly. But there's Anglo-Saxon, which is the foundation, foundational. And at uh, Oxford and Cambridge, Lewis and Tolkien insisted that English literature begin with Anglo-Saxon. And the study thereof, that all students uh, ought to know the, also the history of the language and its development, because the language is part of the literature. So you would begin with Anglo-Saxon. Then there would be uh, Middle English, Medieval English. Chaucerian English, and then you get to something like modern English. I don't know if there's an exact date on it, but with Shakespeare, we're now dealing with recognizably modern English, which is in the 16th century. I don't want to spend too much time on it, <coughs> but we saw last semester that in uh, Spencer's defense of poesy, writing in the 16th century, he was writing in English, and he also wrote English poetry himself. So when Eagleton begins his framing of the rise of English, to read the first line, in 18th century England, uh, he is summarizing what, it's, what, it, what, what it was before. So I'll just read the sentence. In 18th century England, the concept of literature was not confined as it sometimes is today to creative or imaginative writing. It meant the whole body of valued writing in society. Philosophy, history, essays, and letters, as well as poems. What made a text literary was not whether it was fictional. The 18th century was in grave doubt about whether the new upstart form of the novel was literature at all, he says, correctly, but whether it conformed to certain standards of quote unquote polite letters. OK, let me stop with that. And then I will carry on with what he says. <coughs> Note that he includes under literature and the consensus of what it con constitutes literature before that uh, valued writing, and he includes with that philosophy, history, essays, and letters, as well as poems. Is that what Sir Philip Sidney said when he talked about the defense of poesy? Did he speak of history and philosophy as poesy or literature? No. He, he starkly, sharply distinguished them. In the ancient Greek world, was Homer considered to be writing in the same genre and the same type of writing as Plato and Aristotle? Was he writing the same genre of writing as Herodotus and Thucydides? The answer is no, he was not. And they were never thrown under the same bracket of literature. So the opening gambit, which is meant to be a sweeping summative statement, uh, which is true about whatever, uh, whatever precedes it, is simply false. And he must know it is so as well because this man is not unintelligent or without education. So he's framing his discussion by giving a summary statement which is inaccurate. And that inaccuracy at the beginning, in definition, is going to be telling for what comes thereafter. Remember, he left off uh, when we were looking at him last in uh, his introduction there, his preamble to it by claiming that there is no such thing as literature, which is an extraordinary thing because if it, literature includes all valued writing, then there's also no history or philosophy or anything else for that matter. <coughs> 
there's no valued writing because value is a transitive term and values change. So there's just writing. He can't dispute that there was writing. He does dispute that there's value to the writing and he throws everything else underneath <coughs> that a very broad uh, net, I would say, and catches everything in it, or so he thinks. But just, just pointing out that he has misrepresented what the 18th century assumes uh, is, I think, helpful, um, because I think it immediately undermines the whole case. And it becomes even more apparent when then you look at what did constitute literature and what literature meant <coughs> before that. And we, we spent some time looking at <coughs> what the literary tradition prior to this period did think about it. But there's no doubt about the transformation in the uh, Enlightenment and in the Romantic period. There's no doubt about that. But his summary of what happened before is, is troubling. Let me read on with what he says here. Now he says, whether it conformed to certain standards of polite letters. So polite letters is the, all of these, the, what he's just summarized here. In, uh, in French, it's belle lettre, beautiful writing, rather than polite writing. The word polite writing in, in English has the connotations of certain, a certain sophistication or urbanity, maybe even a certain class consciousness. Where these are people act politely, they speak in a certain uh, accent, and they talk about certain subject matters, they avoid vulgarity, etc., and that's polite uh, letters. That is not the only connotations of polite letters, by the way. Polite letters comes from this uh, Greek word, the polis. <coughs> and I would, I would, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to agree if it, that it's polite letters to a degree insofar as it will belong to the polis, and therefore the uh, cultural entity of the gathered families, not just the individuals, but the families, and they together will form a polis, a civilization. So it, it has a broader import than merely a class conscious type of ideological uh, presentation as Eagleton represents. So it is polite letters. That's correct. And it's for the polis, and it's for the governance of the polis, and it's for the understanding of the polis, and what the purpose of the city is, what it is to be doing, what its cultural mandate is. That, in that, I would agree with polite letters, but the way he puts it, it's just for people who drink tea with their finger, their pinky finger extended. That's, they drink out of China teacups. <coughs> now, read that on. The criteria of what counted as literature in other words, were frankly ideological. Writing which embodied the values and tastes of a particular social class qualified as literature. Whereas a street ballad, a popular romance, and perhaps even the drama did not. At this historical point then, the value ladenness of the concept of literature was reasonably self-evident. Actually, it's not even remotely self-evident. Your presentation of it is reasonably self-evident for an ideologue Marxist. Sorry. <coughs> that, that is value laden and it is reasonably self-evident. It is self-evident. Uh, so what constitutes literature? Well, if Shakespeare is literature, you tell me, are the working classes, not that it even exists, it's an anachronism, but in the 18th century, are the commoners presented favorably in Shakespeare's plays? Are they considered to be important people? Are they seen that way in classical literature? Not really, but are they in <coughs> Shakespeare? Yes, they are. Are the middle classes presented? Yes. Are the aristocrats presented? Yes. Is there a sense of the whole and each straight stratum of the society having a significance represented in Shakespeare's views and in the way he presents the world? And I would say, yes. <clears throat> I'm not going to argue it because it's not a place for it, but I would say that it is the case. Well, that will include street ballad ballads, popular romances, and, and so forth. So the common speech is being presented in Shakespeare's comedies. And that is in something that is most certainly called literature, even by Eagleton in his age. He say there may be a day when we no longer consider Shakespeare to be literature, but in his day, when he writes this in 1982, it most decidedly is. <coughs> 
<coughs> and in that text, we will see commoners being presented. Same thing in Chaucer, by the way. It's not just tales of aristocrats. The take, on the other hand, that, that literature and poetry historically had been about aristocrats stems from the Romantics. The Romantics said that previous poetry was about the aristocrats and aristocratic things. And it didn't concern the common people, didn't talk about them, didn't take any interest in them, which I think is uh, Wordsworth's take and presentation on what he is saying. And it's, it's motivated by the French Revolution and the rebellion against <coughs> the aristocracy and so forth. You can see its own cultural context informing its presentation of the, the new form of poetry that Wordsworth had. But again, is it strictly true that poetry had only ever concerned itself with aristocrats? And I think the answer is no. But the heroes did tend to be, I think. But that's a different point. Poetry did concern shepherd boys. There's something called, uh, you know, eclogues and so forth. It's a significant literary form. Those are shepherd boys, they're not princes. Comedies, likewise. Tragedies, for sure, they had heroes. They were kings, princes, and so forth. Epics also, but significant genres of literature uh, concern themselves with the common life and a celebration of it. <coughs> so when he says that the value-ladenness of the concept of literature as a species of ideology is self-evident, it's self-evident in his framing of it, but not if you actually look at the history of Eng uh, even English literature, and he's talking about the rise of English, not literature in a broader sense. But I would say, with T.S. Eliot, as we saw last time, that English literature is hearkening back to a long age, so the individual talent is in a dialogue with the tradition, and that tradition goes back to Homer and the Bible and Virgil and so forth. And there is that tradition that accompanies the individual and he's speaking within the context of that. It's a very different take than Eagleton's here. I just want to say that at the outset, because after we've said that, then it starts to become less objectionable. But take away, let's take away the framing, because the framing is going to then lead him to what comes at the end of it all, <clears throat> which is that we can dispense with the whole notion of literature because it was always ideological. Or rather, let's grant that it was always ideological and let's use a, an ideology which conforms to our age and get rid of previous notions of ideology and literature. And in this, he's not only attacking <coughs> or undermining or dismissing the tastes as if these were subjective things of the 18th century uh, men and women who were writing, because it was women by the 18th century as well. Uh, he's also dismissing everything of value uh, and value judgment, and particularly Christianity. That goes with it. And I think this is the implicit <coughs> uh, ground of attack. The idea that there is a, a natural order and a moral, objective moral nature connected to that, that's really dismissed in all of this. It's just ideology. Anyway, let me carry on. He said, <coughs> but I, I, you, you see what I'm saying here. It's, a, it's a, a telling introduction. In the 18th century, however, he says, literature did more than embody certain social values. It was a vital instrument for their deeper, deeper entrenchment and wider dissemination. And then he, then he does give us historical context, which is the English Civil War. So the 18th century is presented as a um, Eagleton being a Marxist sees the English Civil War as really a class conflict and not a religious war, which I think if you see it and read anything of the period, and you can read the uh, work of my colleague, uh, Dr. Ian Gentles on this, because he's an English Civil War specialist, uh, it is certainly not about, it's not a class warfare thing. It's, this is an absurd way of reading it. Religion is all important in this period. <coughs> And that is an aspect of that. And he says, but they'd emerged from a bloody civil war in the previous century that set the social classes at each other's throats. No, it didn't. The aristocrats were on both sides of the conflict. Cromwell was an aristocrat. He was a minor one, but he was still an aristocrat. 
It's true the monarch had one side, so it was the cavaliers and the roundheads. And it's true that on the one wing of the um, Civil War, on the Republican side, there were the levelers who were probably the working class. And they literally wanted to remove all um, social rank and hierarchy. They wanted it all gone. Now, in that sense, the levelers were the early precursors to the French Revolution and so forth, but they were not the dominant group within that coalition. They were on the margin of it. <clears throat> but he says that, the, that literature at that point was trying to reestablish the order that it lost in the English Civil War, and therefore it, it exalts neoclassical notions of reason, nature, order, and propriety, presents them in art. And there is truth in that. On the other hand, to speak against his thesis, the same thing's being presented in France, and there is no bloody civil war in France. And in fact, France is the center of neoclassicism. The French Revolution had not yet taken place there. So it's not a reactionary thing for the French to embrace neoclassicism, right? No, there's, there's nothing to react against. So again, his, his take on it <coughs> is, uh, I'd say, tendentious and misrepresents the situation. England is following France in the 18th century. You might argue that it was, it was doing so for reactionary reasons, but that's a, that doesn't explain why the French are doing it. Okay? <laughs> so that, that I would say in that. Now, but he says literature uh, is then not what it will become, which is the Romantics take on it, which is uh, uh, personal experience or personal response or imaginative uniqueness. Um, he says they, those don't count in the 18th century novel of Her Henry Fielding. And he's, he's right, they don't. And it was, in fact, only with what we now call the Romantic period, roughly, depends on which scholar you speak to, but it could be, begin as early as 1750, probably the influence of Rousseau on English writing, um, and probably goes all the way to 1830, but it could be a shorter timeline. That's the Romantic period. He says, it's only then that our own definitions of literature began to develop. Now, when he says our definitions of literature, who's our? Who's the we? I do think it's the, the, the general consensus of the literary establishment. But we just saw last time that T.S. Eliot was writing against that romantic tendency in appealing to tradition. No? And I mentioned T.E. Hume with his Romanticism and Classicism saying the same thing even before Eliot. So even in the midst of this movement towards a romantic view of literature and romantic view of life and a revolutionary politics, there is a, a significant, if maybe a not the central movement, uh, which is connected to a, a classicism and a traditional view which is opposed to the modern development. So when he says the we, he means everybody who's on his side sees it this way, as the way literature is. So it's imaginative writing. Eliot doesn't see it that way. Neither does Hume. Neither does uh, actually any of the figures that he's about to cite. They don't see it that way either. And he presents them as if they did. In other words, uh, Eagleton is a, is a romanticist, just like Bloom is, by the way his assumptions about things. It's just that he repudiates the thing that is central to his thesis, namely that literature is imaginative writing, and if it's not imaginative writing, which he says it clearly isn't, then there is no literature. So having come up with the specious concept of writing, if he can, uh, he can destroy the specious concept, he says, Ergo, there is no such thing as literature. Okay. But I, and I will agree with that if we are talking about literature as being defined and uh, restricted to imaginative writing, and that's it. But that's not all there is to it. So you follow the argument so forth. I, I think that's fairly clear. But he says that at, at the modern sense of the word literature only really gets underway in the 19th century, which is true. Literature in the sense of the word is an historically recent phenomenon. It was invented sometime around the turn of the 18th century, 
not sure about that, and would have been thought extremely strange by Chaucer or even Pope. True, it would. What fir happened first was a narrowing of the category of literature to so-called creative or imaginative work. The final decades of the 18th century witness a new division and demarcation of discourses, a radical or reorganizing of what we might call the quote unquote discursive formation of English society. Yes, and then he cites uh, Shelley's defense of poetry in 1821. Shelley, defense of poetry. Who else wrote a defense of poetry? Sir Philip Sidney. It, do, you not, do you not think that Shelley is inviting the comparison with Sir Philip Sidney? I can't imagine that a man as literate as Percy Bysshe Shelley was is not asking the reader and inviting the reader to consider this. I, I mean, I, it's extraordinary. <clears throat> but, and, and he even mentions this in uh, his, uh, in, uh, he, he does mention Sidney there, uh, that is uh, Eagleton. But he, does, he rightly says that Shelley's defense is talking about a type of creativity and opposes it to another type of thinking, namely that of the Industrial Revolution which is entirely utilitarian. And uh, in and, and Shelley's rendering, there are two forces at work. There's ta, and he actually even used the Greek, ta poiein, uh, which is of the poet, and then of the um, ta logodzein, of this utilitarian type of way of looking at the world. So if you want reason and poiesis, poie this. There you go. It's hard writing on the board. Poetry and reason, if you will, <coughs> or the imagination and reason. He contrasts them. Well, what does he mean by the reason here? He doesn't mean what Plato means by reason or Aristotle means by reason. He's talking about the materialist, reductionist category of reason of the 18th century. And he opposes poetry to that. Okay, so this is presenting um, Sir Philip Sidney's notion of literature in a different age, in a different context. What does he do to literature in the process? Well, he presents it as opposed to that. I don't disagree that that's what Shelley, to a large degree, is doing there. But he says, but by the time of the Romantic period, literature was becoming virtually synonymous with the imaginative. To write about what did not exist was somehow more soul-stirring and valuable than to pen an account of Birmingham or the circulation of the blood. Was it not? Is it not more soul-stirring than an account of the circulation of the blood? I, if it's not, it's the worst work of literature I've ever heard. I, I'm not saying it's not interesting, but surely more soul-stirring or an account of Birmingham. It, it's a historical account of a, the uh, British um, army turning its guns upon it, the people. In a, there was a revolt. Is that what he's talking? Is this not more soul stirring? Well, uh, at any rate, he talks about imaginary and inventive. And then he says, since we ourselves are post romantics, so the royal we here, and we are post-romantics in the sense of being products of that epoch rather than confidently posterior to it. So we are informed by the, um, the romantics. So he, he admits what I've just said about him. He is a romantic in his sensibilities. He assumes that the, what the romantics said about the tradition and its rejection of the tradition is legitimate while at the same time dismissing the thing that they thought was most central namely the literature of the imagination, <clears throat> which is a very contradictory and difficult place for him to be in. Because literally he's saying that he has no basis for any of his views. We are post-romantics. We follow in their wake. We think as they, as they thought. We assume that things are the way that they are. But I, Terry Eagleton, am telling you 
that the romantics, of which I am one, were wrong. That's it. In which case, why am I, listen why am I reading you? So I you hope you're not asking that. I'm, I'm reading this and I'm presenting it to you because the Academy follows in Eagleton's way. That's why. This is an influential text and it does more or less uh, establish points of reference as truthful, which we can all assume in our account of um, the, the thing that most bad English essays or first, uh, first year undergrad essays begin with, which was in the history of mankind. It's the first sentence. You probably wrote them. I wrote them myself. First paragraph in the whole history of mankind, and then that's the you know, and then we go on like, oh, okay, which we've all read as 18-year-olds, making the summary statement, and then w having made that summary statement, we will then roll out the romantic view of life because the romantics prove this definitively, right? Because we assume that we live in the post-romantic era. So every undergrad who comes here is a romantic. I've said this to you in classes and. Um, I didn't mean it to be insulting. It's more of a descriptive account. Uh, it's also insulting, but the purpose of noting it was not insulting. It's insulting because it's, it's, it's a ridiculous state of affairs. But my intent is not to insult the audience because they don't even know that, what I think at that point. So <coughs> we, and I would include myself under that description as well. I certainly wrote essays that made that sort of ridiculous sweeping statement which every professor should scratch out and say, have you read all of history? And, you know, <laughs> have you read, have you read any, in fact? Have you done, have you anything but watch television? Anyway, so since we are these things, it's hard for us to grasp just what a curious, historically particular idea this is. He's right in that. It is very odd and it's very hard for us to grasp then why, when he notes this, does he insist on operating within it? Tendentious as it is. He said it would have certainly been most curious to most of the English writers whose quote-unquote imaginative vision we now re reverently elevate above the merely prosaic discourse of those who can find nothing more dramatic to write about than the Black Death or the Warsaw Ghetto. Indeed, it is in the Romantic period that the descriptive term prosaic begins to acquire its negative sense of prosy, dull, uninspiring. And that's true. It's a pejorative term in the, come the Romantic period. <coughs> Prior to that, it's a form of writing which simply doesn't have meter. So poetry is distinguished by meter. It's metrical writing. And there are certain genres of literature that are written in poetry with, with meter and a certain type of meter depending on the genre. But even prose will use literary devices. It will use rhetoric and forms of rhetoric. The schemes and the tropes that we looked about in practical criticism, you'll find them in uh, prose as well as in poetry. Uh, that's true. And, and we don't think that the writing of uh, Cicero is prosaic we would almost say it's poetic because we don't want to diminish it as powerful writing. At any rate, uh, so, so it's, it, it acquires this negative sense of prosy, dull, and spiny. If what does not exist is felt to be more attractive than what does, if poetry or the imagination is privileged over prose or quote-unquote hard fact, then it is a reasonable assumption that this says something significant about the kinds of a society in which the Romantics lived. Yes, it does. It's escapist. It's um, utopian. It's apocalyptic, even. I think this influence, so my take as a romantic scholar on what is a feature of romantic writing, this appeal to the imagination, this internalization of the quest narrative. You read heroic ballads of the, of the medieval period, uh, the Knights of the Round Table, these, these quests, these adventures that they go on, you don't find them in romantic writing. There's an internal um, progression going on. It's the development of the soul of the narrator which you are witnessing. Let's say in, in uh, Dickens' narratives, it's the growth of the character as a moral individual. Think of great expectations. It's a Bildungsroman. It's, it's a telling term. Bildung in, in German has um, 
the uh, notion of, of development, of, of growth, and even of education. Some of the connotations of paideia, actually, except you guard it, you guide it rather yourself. So it's an internal, natural growth of the character. Um, <laughs> so it's a, it's, it's no longer. There's no longer any um, governance from above. There's no plan. There's no sense of um, accord between the culture and the natural world. There's no sense of God. Uh, intervening, let alone uh, providing for the context of human history, there is a widespread humanist rebellion against all forms of authority. <laughs> and the assertion which you've heard me in my classes talk about of the uh, individual seen as an orphan. So the heroes then become orphans in literature from this point onwards. That is very new. Any, if you look at the portrait of orphans in all literature prior to this period, it's the most pitiable state. In the Bible, it's, it's a state that gets mentioned um, as so hard uh, for an individual that there's a special need to take care of the widows and the orphans for that, for that very reason. But come the Romantic period, it takes on a very different uh, resonance and the imagination that goes with it. So an orphan usually does not succeed well in life. It's not a good place to begin. It's possible, but it's a, it is a hard beginning because uh, the human beings being as depraved as they are prey on the weak and orphans are weak. They have no protection. Um, so um, that is the kind of society. Well, what is that kind of society? One in which there is a throwing off of authority. The historical period in question is one of revolution in America and France. Now I, on behalf of my American brethren, would, would reject the conflation of the American and the French revolutions. They're not the same. The Americans, um, uh, it, it's, it's a very different, I, I can't get into it here. But in France, they chop off the head of the king. They establish a statue to reason. It's roughly the same time period, um, but it's much more informed by limited government and the desire for um, responsible government in the US. In, the, in Britain, uh, it doesn't even happen at all. In France, it is far, far more bloody and purposefully bloody. And deliberately leveling and it carries on and to some degree and the French Republic which rose up there have been five of them since then so it's constantly going down the order has been dis whereas there's no such thing in the US but that's to get into the weeds of the historical account too much but he says but these were overthrown by middle-class insurrection I'm not quite so sure about that, but while England achieves its point of economic takeoff, arguably on the back of the enormous profits it has reaped from the 18th century slave trade and its imperial control of the seas to become the world's first industrial capitalist nation. All these claims I'm just going to throw, uh, leave aside because I, I would dispute al almost every one of them. At least I'd want a little attenuation other than that and not simply the throwing out, this is the summary statement of exactly what went on there. But anyway, we'll just let it go. But the visionary hopes and dynamic energies released by these revolutions, well, I will say one thing about it. The slave trade was abolished by the, the same middle class, by, by Wilberforce, uh, by Samuel, by a whole host of Christian and, and even all, and also non-Christian people who oppose it within Britain, and they pay back in terms of reparations, uh, huge sums of money, gave up huge sums, which is not to deny the atrocity. But the, uh, the wealth that it was accumulated was, was given back in, in many ways. But uh, leave that aside um, there. But in England, a crassly Philistine utilitarianism, utilitarianism is rapidly becoming the dominant ideology of the industrial middle class, fetishizing fact, 
reducing human relations to market exchanges and dismissing art as unprofitable ornamentation. Okay, so that description. Is this not true of Eagleton? He fetishizes fact. He reduces human relations to market exchanges. He's a Marxist. And he dismisses art as unprofitable ornamentation. Did he not say literature is an empty set? So wherein does he differ? I, I just don't see it. At any rate, and at the end of all this, the English state reacts with a, to, um, in response to the working class in England trying to follow the lead of the French Revolution and the terrible terror that ensued thereafter by, it, by, by it actually, uh, the terrors. So the French Revolution, mo many in England were sympathetic to it because the aristocrats were uh, appalling in their oppression and their brutality and their callousness. But then it gave way to the reign of terror in which those who overthrew through the uh, French aristocracy became as bad, if not worse, than the people that they executed. And so then there was another bloodletting in which the former leaders were now the oppressors and then they came up against them and it just didn't stop. You know, well, it did stop. How did it stop? Napoleon. They elected a strong man. And then what did he do? He brought the French Revolution around, all around Europe by, at the, uh, behind the French army, conquered the whole of Europe. And the English aristocrats, unsurprisingly, didn't like this and thought it wasn't a very good idea. And so did the middle class. It wasn't just the aristocrats. They didn't have that much power. The middle classes also didn't want it, and neither did many in the working class, for that matter. As bad as the Industrial Revolution was. But I, would, I think that's at least debatable. But he says, the English state reacts with a brutal political repressiveness which converts England during part of the Romantic period into what is in effect a police state. England, the place where the rule of law in general holds, where there is a separation of powers, <coughs> in which there's freedom, and it's been preserved like no other country to my knowledge is a by this account, a police state. Come on. Okay, how about the account of France then? Does he talk about the French? No. Anyway, drives me crazy. But I will skip all, all, over all that and, and just note the points of contention on the account. <coughs> but he talks about um, then the notion of literature that arises. So this is of imaginative creation. Imaginative creation as opposed to fact. And he notes this about romantic poetry, and I think he's correct in this. For all its rhetor this is on 18, for all his rhetorical claim to be representative of humankind, to speak with the voice of the people and utter eternal verities, the romantic artist existed more and more on the margins of a society which was not inclined to pay high wages to prophets. So we might read in the Romantic period the great Romantic poets Wordsworth and Shelley and Byron and Keats and Blake, <coughs> but are they being widely read? Or are they being read amongst a, social, a certain social stratum? Is poetry a, uh, read by everyone at this time? I think it's still quite widely read actually. But com I, I compared to present day, at any rate, but but I do agree what he says here to some degree. If you're a revolutionary, you don't get paid because you get paid by the powers that be, and if you're opposed to the powers that be, you're not going to get any money out of it. And it is, uh, uh, to some degree, a moment of uh, a movement of protest. <clears throat> but the finely passionate idealism of, of the Romantics then was also idealist in a more philosophical sense of the word. Deprived of any proper place within the social movements which might actually have transformed industrial capitalism into a just society, the writer was increasingly driven back into the solitariness of his own creative mind. Um, I don't know about that, but anyway. I do agree with the conclusion. Is it because there was no 
place for him to guide these things, or it was because the, the, the whole notion of romanticism was an internalized quest from the very outset. Uh, that's my contention. Romanticism was always an internal quasi-religious movement. It's a spiritual revival. It, it, it never intended on being a political movement, although some of them were politically uh, motivated, like Shelley. There's no doubt about that. And Byron as well. These were revolutionaries. I don't, I don't discount that. But if you look at much of their writing, it's largely internal, internalized, um, personal, spiritual development. It's not actually meant to be more than that. But I guess we could, we could dispa dispute that. <coughs> but he moves on, and this, and this is where I think it gets a little bit more interesting. Um, it is no accident that the period we are discussing, 18th and 19th century, sees the rise of modern aesthetics or the philosophy of art. You've heard me on this front, that aesthetics is a new philosophical discipline, even the word is new. It is mainly from this era in the work of Kant, Hegel, Schiller, Coleridge, and others that we inherit our contemporary ideas of the symbol and aesthetic experience or of aesthetic harmony and the unique nature of the artifact. Previously, men and women had written poems, stage plays, or painted pictures for a variety of purposes. Yes, in conjunction with the polis. Everything that concerned the polis, justice, uh, sanctity, and so forth, this was part of literature. Whereas now it was aestheticized, the way Bloom sees it. Um, now these concrete, historically variable practices were being subsumed into some special, mysterious faculty known as the aesthetic. And a new breed of aestheticians sought to lay bare its inmost structures. It was not that such questions had not been raised before, but now they began to assume a new significance. Yes. The assumption that there was an unchanging object known as art, or an isolatable experience called beauty, or the aesthetic was largely a product of the very alienation of art from social life, which we've already touched on. That's partly true. What is also true, and this is my comment, is that art is in particular related to beauty then, according to him. But I would say, historically, art also conveyed more than beauty. It conveyed goodness and truth. And as we saw uh, last semester, the purpose of the poet was to movere et tocere, to move and to teach, or to teach and to delight. And instruction involves a moral component. If you're doing the C.S. Lewis course with me in the Abolition of Man, he makes that plain that historically all education had involved the passions and, and the moral element of man, the spirited element. <coughs> Whereas this is only interest in aesthetics. It's not, it's not teaching per se. Or if it's teaching, it's teaching about aesthetics again. And it's only reducing itself to beauty for beauty's sake or art for art's sake, which Bloom presented as the whole purpose of literature which is a remarkably ignorant statement for such a well-read man, again. <coughs> Historically ignorant. Uh, traditionally ignorant. But he says that this view was the product of a v the very al al alienation of art from social life. Yeah, but more than that, it's reducing beauty from, or it's in connection with the sublime. Remember I talked about this in the 18th century, this new category this aesthetic category of the sublime as opposed to the beautiful, right? The severance of the two in first Edmund Burke and then in Kant, where they're two categorically different experiences. It banishes beauty from the consideration. The aesthetic is mostly concerned with the sublime. At that point, it totally breaks and, this, and the sublime is mostly associated with power the dynamic of power, which so much informs literary theory. 
and the motivation for it. Because even Eagleton's narrative about literary theory and literature is it's all about power. It was it used to be the power of the aristocrats. Now it's the power of the people who see all appeal to literature as just appeal to ideology. Only somebody who accepts that uh, beauty is related to power can make such a claim. So he's following in the wake of Burke and Kant. But again, I said to you, the discussion of beauty prior to these men associate the sublime as the most beautiful thing. So it's not about power. It's about the most beautiful thing. Whereas for Kant and Burke, these are contradictions in terms. The sublime has nothing to do with the beautiful. So these are, that's why we looked at it last semester. These are, these are key turning points. And they will touch on, on uh, Eagleton's whole account of what's happening here. But he says, if literature had ceased to have any obvious function, which it does after Burke and Kant, socially that is, if the writer was no longer a traditional figure in the pay of the court, the church, or an aristocratic patron, as was uh, Dante, or as was Virgil, they had a very wealthy patron, then it was possible to turn this fact to literature's advantage. The whole point of creative writing was that it was gloriously useless, and end in itself, removed from the sordid social purpose. Having lost his patron, the writer discovered a substitute in the poetic. You see how this is working now. After the sublime replaces the beautiful as a category and severs it from notions of goodness and truth, literature associated with the sublime and artists in the Romantic period and onward, they're all trying to get the sublime. They're all trying to be sublime. That's why their heroes are alienated orphans. Powerless, powerless voices, and yet speaking with power, they're gaining power through their originality. And what is the originality? It's about self-expression. In the Bildung, that's being told in the Roman, that will change, take its place. Is that what literature is again? For, for Eagleton, it must be, because that's the way we think. Anyway, at the center of this is the semi-mystical doctrine of the symbol. I haven't talked about this symbol much. And it's not because I don't think it's important, but just because I have too much on my plate. The, sub the symbol is actually, it's Coleridge who most defines what a symbol is. Even the German writers, critics of the period, talk about his writing on the symbol as being uh, the most important. Now, I think that when Coleridge is referring to the symbol, he is trying to bring something of the former uh, natural law tradition into it. But most people think that he's not, that he's the quintessential romantic theorist. And I don't quite think so. I don't think it's quite that straightforward. J likewise, you heard me on his notion of the imagination. I think he's talking about what previous writers, he wants to include their understanding of the imagination and not have a totally new um, faculty of creation ex nihilo, which the other romantics seem to assume, and so does Eagleton. So I think Coleridge is a, uh, a misunderstood figure, but he, and he's the key figure in defining the symbol. What, is, what does the symbol, symbol mean? I'll read his account here, Eagleton's. For romanticism, indeed, the symbol becomes the panacea for all problems. Within it, a whole set of conflicts which were felt to be insoluble in ordinary life between subject and object, the universal and the particular, the sensuous and the conceptual, material and spiritual, order and spontaneity, could be magically resolved. It was not surprising that such conflicts were sorely felt in this period because of the social context. He'll explain this. And Ten lines down, he says, in this sense, the symbol brought such truths to bear on the mind in a way which brooked no question. Either you saw it or you didn't. It was, and this is his statement, it was the keystone of an irrationalism. So romanticism is marked by an irrationalism. Again, I find this a, an odd thing 
to concede if you call yourself as somebody who is falling in the wake of the Romantics as a thinker, which he claims he is. How can you claim that Romanticism is at its roots irrationalism and claim that we think this way without <laughs> acknowledging that what your account is must ipso facto be bunk? But there we have it. He says it was the keystone of an irrationalism, a, or rather he demonstrates that he's not irrational by debunking the irrational, right? Because there's no such thing as literature. But that doesn't solve the problem, because he's still a romantic by his own confession. He just doesn't believe in what they believe. He believes in material progress, the bourgeoisie being overthrown by the proletariat and so forth. So, but it was the keystone of an irrationalism, a forestalling of reason, critical inquiry, which has been rampant in literary theory ever since. It was a unitary thing. And to dissect it, to take it apart, to see how it worked, was almost as blasphemous as seeking to analyze the Holy Trinity. Now, I want, you to, I want to stop there with this comment because he's absolutely correct. So let me move it forward chronologically from this period, the Romantic period, to the study of English literature in the 1970s and 80s when he's writing this, when theory is brought into the academy, as I said to you, post-1960s, and it was received very badly. The literary establishment was more or less defending literature in the Romantic sense. There were traditionalists amongst them, but by and large they, they existed side by side. They had a common view of uh, the humanities, there was a common human nature. They were defending more or less the same thing. Some of them were more aesthetically minded, some of them more traditionally minded, but the romanticists and the classicists sort of coexisted side by side. Come theory, that consensus is broken because the theorists are questioning the very ground of unity which was in the symbol. So they break the symbol. Say so they see themselves as iconoclasts, and they are iconoclasts. They break up that consensus which never ought to have existed. But then again, universities are always fractious places. That's the place where the wars of ideas take place. Some people think in universities, particularly Christian universities, you shouldn't be able to criticize your colleagues' ideas. I think that's the silliest thing I've ever heard. What else would I do? <laughs> I present my ideas, they get criticized, and I criticize others. And we, it's the purpose of this is to come to an understanding of what the truth is, a better understanding. That goes with the goes with the territory. There's nothing personal in it, although we take things personally as I like this idea, I'm going to try and defend it. Well, okay. So somebody, it's very combative. All right. That goes with the university. But he says that it was received as almost as if it were as blasphemous as seeking to analyze the Holy Trinity. And that's true. And that's because T.E. Hume was correct when he called Romanticism, and this is his phrase, Oops, he called it a spilt religion. So it had all the trappings of religion. It had a, the humanly important, the beautiful, or rather the sublime, the symbol, the imagination spoken in hushed terms, but without any real transcendental theology behind it. There's no God in this, but it's the humanistic God that's presented in literature. That was being defended in the academy in the early 1970s. Now, most of them had very vestigial connections with Christianity by this point. The public universities had thrown off their statements of faith. They, know, they used so every public university in Ontario began as a Christian institution, at least any of the ones with any pedigree of, of years. So U of T was an Anglican institution. McMaster was Baptist. Uh, Queens was Presbyterian. Uh, Western was Anglican as well. Uh, Waterloo was uh, Lutheran and so forth. So they had Christian beginnings, the, the older universities here. But, and they had statements of faith and lifestyle policy, just like Tyndale does. And they got rid of them. The faculty decided that, that, that uh, it was a limitation on on their view of the humanities because it had a very sen a specific sense of what human nature was that came from Christian doctrine. The, not just the Trinity, and we bear the image of God, so the human person, but also the, the human nature of Christ. That would define their subject 
to some degree. They got rid of that in the name of progress. And all that's left then is the sort of the, the husk of the university. That, this is my very potted, brief, and ridiculously tenuous account of the, uh, what happens in the universities in the 20th century. And so the Bible college movement arises in its wake as well. So this goes back to the 19th century. Right, the fundamentalist modernist controversy and that, all that sort of thing. So Christians are unhappy with the way in which the academy is moving away from uh, these sorts of things. And all that's left is this thing that corresponded to a religious belief uh, contained in literature now, but it's just connected to symbolism. And the literary theorists of uh, Eagleton's ilk are being blown apart by, by the theorists. So they're re regarded as iconoclasts and bad guys, right? And, and despisers of literature. I mean, listen to Bloom and his, his account of it. These are people who despise literature. He's correct. They do. And he's also correct in thinking that there's something there that's worth holding on to. It's just his defense of it that I find indefensible. Because he's really talking about the thing that Nobody thinks this way anymore. You really are a dinosaur. Although I prefer that dinosaur to the, the new beast that tore it apart, but still, this is not a defensible position. You're defending the 18th century sublime, more or less, in art, and the trivial, and saying that they can have no relevance, and that's why we should do it, because it has no relevance. Wow, extraordinary. Anyway, so he says this, Literature in the meaning of the word we have inherited, this is again, summary statement at the bottom of 19, in the meaning of the word we have inherited is an ideology. Okay, so you explain to me literature in the meaning of the word we have inherited. What is literature in the meaning of that word? What is that form of literature? I speak all the time. What is literature in the meaning of the word we have inherited is an ideology. What is he referring to? What period? What understanding of literature? Replace the word literature with one other word. <clears throat> Can you come up with one? I'm not going to wait too long. Romanticism or the symbol or imaginative writing. Yes in the ways in which it's presented, it is an ideology. It is. It's an ideology of irrelevance to use blooms. So come to university, study English, and take delight in irrelevance. And it will really benefit you. <laughs> You're going to really, really well life it. Come, come on. And you pay Ten times more than I did when I went to university to do that as well. And it, but it's relevant, and it's, it's, it's a time-tested form of irrelevance. It's just as relevant now as it was when I did it. And, uh, if <laughs> that, and I think that's a true statement. If it is irrelevant, then uh, it's just as relevant now as it was then. It remains as irrelevant as it always was. Okay. And, and that's an ideology. Okay, but is that literature? And I think it begs the question. And I've already answered the question by the way I've constructed the course and the way I framed even this discussion. But at any rate, he says it, is the, it still has the most intimate relations to questions of social power. And that's interesting. Why does it have the most intimate relations to questions of social power? Now let me dig down just for two seconds on that. Why the most intimate relations to questions of social power? Because it is related to the sublime or the beautiful, and both of them, following both Kant and Burke, are connected to power. The beautiful is something that we feel powerful in the face of. We see a little kitten and we feel its weakness. And we say, oh, it's cute. It makes us feel beautiful feelings. We see an enormous mountain, the top of which we cannot see, and we feel a sense of our finitude, our mortality. And that's a sublime feeling. It's all about power. 
and we have an intimate feeling of that. Is that what literature is all about? Well, he says it's, it is. That, that is exactly what the intimate social relation is. So our, if we're romanticists, then we invariably interpret all literature as about power. As soon as we agree to that, and I do agree to that, that is the romantic conception, the post-enlightenment conception, Burke, Kant, and everyone that follows, then we either have to accept that and say that literature is an ideological um, exercise of power for somebody, against somebody, or over somebody, or we have to get rid of the whole dang mess and blow it up and go back to a better, and forget about literature and stop reading it, or you need to look at it differently. And the purpose of this course was to look at it differently. But if the reader is still unconvinced, the narrative of what happened to literature in the later 19th century might prove a bit more persuasive. And then he goes on to do that. So then he comes to the 19th century. Now I'm going to have to go over this very quickly. And I'll just mention a few keynote names. We've got 15 minutes now. Uh, bottom of 20, he refers to George Gordon, early professor of English literature at Oxford. And this is his inaugural lecture. And he says this, England is sick. And... English literature must save it. The churches, as I understand, having failed and social remedies being slow, English literature has now a triple function. Still, I suppose, to delight and instruct us. To teach and to delight. So he's, he's an educated man. Literature's always done that but also, and above all, to save our souls and heal the state. Okay, so this is what happened to literature in the 1930s. It became a substitute religious faculty where people no longer went to the church for answers, they went to literature professors for answers about the most profound questions of humanity. We'd find that in great works of literature. And then they would have went to men like one who we will look to, Northrop Frye, the great uh, Canadian figure literary of the literary establishment, who was the uh, principal of Victoria College, um, at, who spoke and, and really, in some ways, pioneered studies in the Bible as literature. You know, three books he wrote on it, and, and he's a very good critic. But he was read at almost as if this is a new religion and people who studied English in this period. So in the 1920s, he will say it's a, almost a uh, illegitimate discipline. In the 1930s, if you have in, any interest in being at the cutting edge of everything, then you study English literature. And I would say it held that position from the 1930s all the way up until the 1960s. So literature was the discipline for a society that on the whole had abandoned um, the church and stop believing what the church was saying about life. You would go to your English professors and the foremost on that front. He says Gordon's words were spoken in our own century. Remember this is the 20th century when he writes this. But they find a resonance everywhere in Victorian England. It is a striking thought that had it not been for this dramatic crisis in mid-19th century ideology, we might not today have a plentiful supply of Jane Austen's case books and bluffer's guides to pound. This is him savagely satirizing the industry, the publishing industry. The key figure is Matthew Arnold, top of 21, actually six lines down. Always preternaturally sensitive to the needs of his social class. Arnold, who writes um, Culture and Anarchy, Arnold is a classicist, but a particularly of, of Greek culture. Very influential in, in, in England, but also in the United States. He comes across the Atlantic in lectures as well. In the main, like at, at Harvard and Princeton and so forth, so the, the big Ivy League in, universities. And he says that the urgent social need is to Hellenize this The Greek word, Greek, the Greeks describe them as, as Hellas. To Hellenize, to make them Greek, to bring Greek culture, to cultivate the Philistine middle class. The middle Philistine middle class who are the self-made 
men who have gained their wealth from their own industry. So the, the big middle class explosion in the United States and in Britain to some degree, right? So if you, wa if you watch Downton Abbey, you know, the, the nouveau riche, they need to be educated. Why do they need to be educated? Because the aristocracy is dying out and we have to maintain social control. Now, for, this is, this is uh, Eagleton's account, but there's something in what Arnold says as well. There's an anarchy looming where there's no value held by a society. There's nothing of value. It's all about gaining wealth. We have to educate people that there are values they need to hold on to. And so it's something like an aristocracy. And what does he say? State established schools by linking the middle class to, quote, the best culture of their nation will confer on them, quote, a greatness and a noble spirit which the tone of these classes is not itself at present adequate to impart. So it's in order to, to maintain social order according to uh, Eagleton. I think there's a little bit more to it than that. But he is acknowledging that the, we, it's no longer the aristocrats that call the shots anymore. It, democracy and the expansion of the vote uh, which will uh, eventually follow um, and already has happened in England and will eventually come to women in the 20th century um, will mean that everybody who has a vote needs to have the uh, knowledge that aristocrats once had in order to guide us with wisdom and, and uh, to make good judgments. Otherwise, the nation is going to be destroyed. <coughs> and then here's the quote from... Um, Arnold that he gives, and it's a lengthy one. It is of itself a serious calamity for a nation that its tone of feeling and grandeur of spirit should be lowered or dulled. But the calamity appears far more serious still when we consider that the middle classes, remaining as they are now, with their narrow, harsh, unintelligent, and unattractive spirit and, and culture, will almost certainly fail to mold or assimilate the masses below them, whose sympathies are at the present moment actually wider and more liberal than theirs. They arrive, these masses, eager to enter into possession of the world, to gain a more vivid sense of their own life and activity. In this, their irrepressible development, their natural educators and in initiators are those immediately above them, the middle classes. If these classes cannot win their sympathy or give them their direction, society is in danger of falling into anarchy. That's from culture and anarchy. So he's laying it upon the middle class to educate the working classes by being, by, um, being good role models, effectively, by being teachers, as the aristocrats were once looking after the, the uh, people on their estate. So now the middle class, it's laid on the middle class to hold society together because <clears throat> the aristocrats no longer have the power and, or the prestige or the influence that they once did. So that is the aim. And he says he's refreshingly unhypocritical. It's not because he cares about the working classes, it's just to keep them from themselves, basically. <clears throat> So literature in this account becomes the opiate of the middle class. This is account of his account of the rise of liter English literature. It is a sort of a middle class religion. And if you look at how literature is studied in the main line and presented, the Bible is presented in main line denominations, you can see that they treat the Bible as a work of literature only. And as their mandate to have a, so a certain social standing, it's a big social club, and we ought to look out for the poor by which they mean we ought to keep them in line. It's more of a social obligation. But I'll skip over all that. Um, then he goes on to the um, how uh, English as an academic study, because this is not an academic study uh, uh, subject as such. That will rise after this. And it first begins not in universities, but in working men's college, colleges. So. Um, further education to so a college like here you could go and study literature there for for men who had uh, very little schooling but wanted to read um, great books 
and get some sort of an education, you could go there. That's where it was first taught. So it's a cheapish form of liberal education. So it's, it doesn't require Greek and Latin. You can do it in your own language. But you will gain moral values there. That's the purpose of it. <laughs> and F.R. Levis, who he mentions here on 24 and 25, is the most important figure in the 20th century in some ways. Um, Levis regards literature as the moral ideology of the modern age. So this is where we learn moral values. So it's the moral sense tradition. F.R. Levis, L-E-A-V-I-S. <clears throat> and basically his take here, which I think is probably not correct, or probably, probably correct, bottom of 25, the only way in which English seemed likely to justify its existence in the ancient universities, that is Oxford and Cambridge, was by systematically mistaking itself for the classics. But the classicists were hardly keen to have this pathetic parody of themselves around. So it was, they looked down their noses at the Lewises and the Tolkien's. And the only th reason that they managed to survive is because they had themselves been classically educated. So they had the same literary background and they justified their subject uh, on the grounds that the classicists would have accepted. Anyway, um, Levis is the most important figure in the 1920s and 30s, uh, and he writes in a journal called Scrutiny, famous journal. We're not talking about the whole of English uh, lit theory, just the rise of English here. Uh, I'll just read this from the middle of 27. Scrutiny was the title of the critical journal, not launched in 1932 by the Levises, F.R. and his wife, which has yet to be surpassed in its tenacious devotion to the moral centrality of English studies, their crucial relevance to the quality of social life as a whole. So the moral sense tradition which comes with Levis, there's something that's deeply embedded in uh, English literature to this day. And he says that there are, to this day, English students in England who are Levisites, whether they know it or not. Irredeem, irrem, 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 I'm going to skip, I can't even say it. Altered by that historic intervention. Gosh, I can't even, I can't say it. That's a funny thing. You don't have to be a card-carrying Levisite any more than you have to be a card-carrying Copernican. It's in the bloodstream. <coughs> and they see that it, there has to be a moral component in English literature for it to survive. That's its legitimacy. In that sense, I guess I am a Levisite, but note this, Levis had a canon of literature and Lewis objected to it. You didn't like the idea of a canon of literature. You didn't like that there was gonna be a moral pope who was gonna be Levis telling us what we ought to read. He thought it was a bad idea. He didn't think that there wasn't an, an analogy to be made between the canon of scripture and the canon of literature. It has all the wrong connotations. Literature is not a substitute for what scripture does. Whereas for Levis and the, I would say, the humanist movement, it is a, a sort of substitute religion. And I would grant you it's probably better than something, uh, some of its alternatives, but still I don't think it's adequate. Anyway. Um, but I think I'm going to have to leave it at that. Um, I am close to end out of time. Do you want to uh, ask any comment any, or have any questions here? But note their, their methodology. Let me conclude with this. The methodology of the Levisite was close reading. Close reading is taking a literary text and just reading it and commenting on it. So that methodology, which F.R. Levis used, was the equivalent of what I would say happens in Protestant circles in a Bible study. You read the text, you let the text speak to you. You have commentators, you have a social context, it's not to 
but to some degree it's the text that speaks to you. Now you can see that I'm, uh, from my teaching, I'm a Levisite in that sense, unintentionally, but more or less that's how I teach. But note that this, they think that it will save Western culture, which I don't. I don't think reading Shakespeare will save Western culture. But the methodology of reading, I think, is powerful, and it really is a Protestant understanding of what the word does. And it's really a parody of that. But now it's the word of Shakespeare, it's the word of Milton, it's the word of Dunn, it's the word of Dickens, of Hardy, whatever, and this is going to shape us and give us a moral character that will allow us to preserve the nation. So it is, a, it is an alternative to scripture. It's the best that you can do in English literature, as only English literature, unless you see English literature in some sense connecting to the Bible. But Levis doesn't do that. That's what happens here. But it doesn't happen in many places. At least that's what we try to do here. I tried to make connections there. Um, but that's not what Levis does. But that's, that's the rise of English. That's his account of it. I've given my uh, critique of it, but also my appreciation for it. I thought, hope you found it valuable. We come next time to hermeneutics. What is it? I, uh, it's on the website, by the way.